excited to welcome back to the Kelly Alexander Show award-winning choreographer, Tina Landon. Tina, how are you? Woo! I'm good, as always. Fantastic. Well, you have uh, had a, a busy while because you were in the uh, Janet Jackson documentary that everybody's been watching, over 15.7 million people at last check, and I'm sure that's going to keep keep climbing. So many people saw you, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, first of all, I wanted to know, when did they uh, approach you to do this? And was it like super exciting for you to get this, this opportunity to talk about Janet's life and career? Uh, I want to say it was, they were already partway uh, filming it. I think it was back in October. I went to New York and met with them and um yeah you know i actually janet called me and asked me if i wanted to be a part of the doc and of course i was like absolutely you know be a part of this her legacy and our time together and all of that so yeah i was super honored and excited to be a part of it amazing and so did uh, you said you had to go to new york so what was that experience like uh being there was there a big team was it just you and the director and a camera guy like how did it all kind of roll out uh, yeah, the crew was really small. It was just the director, Ben, and probably three or four other um, crew members. And then it was just myself, which was weird. You know, I went in the night before. They were very gracious. So I'm like, please don't make me come in at five in the morning to do an interview and then leave the same day because I will be done. Like, I don't travel well. <laughs> so I flew in the night before. It was a very quiet night. I just kind of walked around New York and been there in years since before COVID. Um, and so it was just kind of easy breezy. Amazing. Now, did they do like a pre-interview with you to sort of give you an idea of what was coming up or was it just like a surprise as you sat down and, and got asked the questions? Uh, complete surprise, actually. I had talked to Ben the night before, he called and wanted to make sure I got in all right and everything was good. And I was like, hey, do you wanna send over, you know, some general questions or something that I could look through because, you know, not everybody is Kelly Alexander and has all the dates and all the stats. And I have none usually, like, you know, my brain, it's like, wait, that was on what album and that was what year? And I get everything all mixed up together. Um, and he's like, no, no, you know, we're just gonna, we're just gonna fly by the seat of our pants and we're gonna uh, um, concentrate on the Janet album. And I was, I was waiting for, and then we're gonna do, and then we're gonna do it. I was like, that's it? Like, that's all I get to talk about was the one album. And yeah, and when, you know, when uh, the time when she started to experiment with more being more sexual. And I was like, okay. And you know, I hung up the phone a little bummed because I'm like, I don't want to just talk about that. I hope we, I hope that's just going to be one thing and then we'll ease into all the work and how we, you know, came to be together and all that kind of stuff. Since this is going to be kind of a, her legacy left behind, that was kind of my assumption. We're going to get back to your experience with, with uh, telling your story to them, but knowing that you have been a part of the Rhythm Nation album as a dancer, and then obviously the Janet album as a choreographer and a dancer, and then Velvet Rope, like choreographer, I believe creative director as well, right? And dancer. Uh, <laughs> when you watched the document documentary itself, were you a little surprised that they didn't spend a lot of time on Velvet Rope? Yeah, I was very surprised because I felt that the Velvet Rope, at least for me in my experience, was kind of um, I don't want to say the height of her career, but it kind of felt that way, especially looking back and kind of seeing how everything, you know, climaxed to that point. And I felt like that, you know, the velvet rope was the top of the hill that we kind of had all worked so hard towards. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I thought, well, maybe she felt that she's talked enough about it or that there's been enough press about it already. Um, Lord knows I've talked about it a million times <laughs> and all the dancers involved. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I was a little surprised. Yeah. Okay. So now you're sitting down with Ben and you're being recorded and they start with like, what, like with Janet tour, like, or did they even ask you how you and Janet became friends? No, they never asked that. So I kind of felt like, okay, maybe they again feel like that's been said and done and let's just move to uh, 
the story that they wanted to tell. And I know that they had to, you know, block it out in four segments is what they told me and that I was going to be in segment three. And at that point that was going to be the Janet album. So in my head, I was like, Oh, okay. So we have surpassed the meet and greet of how we came together. We've surpassed the rhythm nation tour, all of that. And we're just now jumping here. Um, but really kind of the first question, they went right into what was going on with Janet at that time? Why was she so happy? And that's really kind of where it started. And it really wasn't so much about, they did touch on it a little bit about how I came to start choreographing for her, especially on that first song um, and how sex, how sexy it was. And, you know, I've talked a lot about how us both, both being tomboys and kind of feeling a little outside of our comfort zone that we worked really great together because we had that uh, mutual trust. And that's kind of just, they kind of launched right into why was she so happy? What was going on in her life? And why did she make this change? And because you had talked to us in the past about how it started on the Level Never Do Without You video during Rhythm Nation, where she had to be a bit more sexy. And I know she had an issue with that, not issue with that, but she had to kind of really warm herself up and you helped her with that. So by the time the Janet album came around, was there still some trepidation or was she ready to go, especially because this was coming off of Poetic Justice? I think she was much more open to it, especially after Level Never Do came out and it was such a success and everyone was like, oh my God, like she's gorgeous, she's beautiful. She was kind of coming out of being the tomboy and uh, strong social, social messaging in Rhythm Nation to now kind of just being free and like loving life and experiencing love. Um, yeah, that um, forgot the initial question, but that's where we are. <laughs> See, that's that's great. Does. <laughs> that's totally fine. Now, um, in the documentary, again, like there's that part, especially where, you know, you're enveloped all around that Janet album. Um, it very much intoned, obviously, that that her and Renee were a creative powerhouse. And he was very involved in her career at that point, directing the again video, um, which, of course, is, is very sensual and very sexy. And, you know, do you, was she fully on board with that? Like, because it seemed to be like, she seemed co totally comfortable and, 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 you know, ready to bring out this side of her. Uh, I just want to make sure that that's like confirm or deny. As far as I know, I would confirm. I really wasn't in those talks. Those I think came about really just between her and Renee and, um, you know, he was, con his wheels were constantly spinning. He, there's, and like I said in the documentary, which is what I was referring to, was that he has no off button. So while the rest of us go, okay, let's put that to bed. We're going to play a game and, you know, go jump in the ocean or something. Renee's wheels are still spinning. It's like he, he, he just can't get out of this like kind of creative mode. So I know that, um, I, I know that she trusted him a lot. She also trusted his vision as a director. So I think she felt comfortable going into that knowing that, he was never going to put her out there looking bad or or really do anything that was going to compromise her career. Can you expand upon their relationship just a little bit? Not that I want to get into any sort of like personal details, really, because that's none of our business. But in the documentary, it kind of, you know, they, they did go there. They did talk about their relationship and, and how it was like great and they were a team. And then, you know, things started to go south and then they did go south. But. I just wanted to know because you were there, you were you. I think you were a part of her life the most during Renee's time of her being or of him being there the most. So you saw that whole evolution. Can you just explain, um, like, where his head was at when it comes to Janet? Because you've told us before in another interview that he really was Team Janet all the way. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, Renee ate, drank, sweat, bled. Janet like that was and I'm not saying he was like obsessed with her it's just that they were a team and I think you know that all kind of came together during Rhythm Nation and again that was my first tour with her I had worked other projects with her with you know doing videos and stuff but I was never really involved in the makings of anything or the behind the scenes so I kind of came in 
about halfway through, I would say, uh, the Rhythm Nation project. But Renee was always around. He was in rehearsal. He was making comments. And if you didn't know, you would think, is he the choreographer? What, what's what's happening? Who's What's happening here? Because he just always had... Um, he just always had a vision, I think, of what this should be, be, knowing what Janet wanted, because they were, you know, they were stuck together like glue. So if anyone knew her vision as well was him. Um, and so I'm trying to even think, I did know Janet before Renee because of working with Paula and doing the videos prior, but also at that time, Janet and Renee were friends. They were building their friendship. So it was kind of like this weird, uh, what is it, six degrees of separation where it's like we all knew each other, but kind of, you know, Renee and Terry and Anthony had their dance group. I was working with Paula. Paula brought in their dance group. It's like we had this weird kind of uh, common friends that for years and so yeah, I got to experience Janet and Renee from prior to Rhythm Nation all the way through to their end, I guess you would say. Was he in um, a challenging situation whereby, you know, he's her closest teammate, he's protecting her, he's like helping to manage the whole situation. He's been, and you know, this is documented you know, throughout social media history before Twitter and, and Facebook even happened when there was like, uh, you know, fan forums, how mm -hmm. great he was with so many fans. Yes. Um, so was like, I, I don't know if people really realize just how much pressure was on him to keep all the, the, the balls spinning in the air. Yeah. You know, I never envied his position ever because, or Janet's, you know, because you're just, they're always out there. I had the best job in the world. I could create, I could work with some awesome people. And then I could go home and nobody really cared what I was doing. Nobody was following. There's no paparazzi. There was no write-ups about who I went to dinner with. Right. So I think that alone is like this, this high pressure baseline. And then you have a relationship, right? So most people didn't know who Renee was until Janet. So they didn't know what his abilities were, what his creativeness was, what his experience behind the camera was prior to that. So there is a pressure, I think, for anyone coming into a marriage or relationship with a well-known, established uh, celebrity that you're always walking that fine line in the public of are they really there creating or are they riding the coattails? And I think you can't help but feel that and especially being a man in that situation. So I feel and again, this is my assumption. This is not words I've had with Renee or, you know, I'm not saying that this is how he felt. I'm just saying it's understandable the pressure that he would have of constantly having this kind of feedback or hearing things about whether or not he was actually part of this creative team or she was just being generous because he was her husband. But Renee was excellent with the fans. I mean, I never even knew what a chat forum was and him and Jan would go in there all the time. Sometimes she would um, go in under a different name and just in, in, you know, and I, and again, that was like, that was like the first Twitter. It's like, oh, I don't want to know what everyone's saying. You know, like, I don't, cause you get crazies in there, right? You got lovely fans and then you get ones that just want to start drama. I guess those are called trolls, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, shows you how much I know. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I personally feel that Renee really brought to their relationship was being able to shield Janet from the crazies, from the people who like, oh, I just need five minutes. Five minutes always turned into an hour. Like she would have no life if there was no screen around her. And I think that being that screen for someone, sometimes you just, you have to take the, the hits and you have to take the bullets that come because that is your job. And then being a protector as in a relationship, a husband, a wife, whatever, 
you are really on the front lines of going, okay, I'm going to shield the person I love so that they don't look bad. They don't, if they don't want to do something, he had to be the one that said, no, she's not interested. And then on the other side of that, you've got the people going, is she really not interested or are you butting in? Like, so it's a, it was a really tough line to, to walk, I think for him or for anybody, like I said, in that situation. Can you also expand upon, cause it, it seemed, um, I don't know if, if unclear is the word, but like how much involvement did he really have in the velvet rope? Cause it felt like a lot from the fans point of view, like at that time, um, I just want to know, like, you, you know, was he there a lot uh, leading up to it? Like, like the album and then the, the, the videos and then, and then the tour. Oh, yeah, he was from beginning to end, he was there. Maybe not so much at the end, but yeah, absolutely. Again, he, it was like his project too. I know that there was um, some collaboration on lyrics and music and all of that. And that was like his baby as well as hers. You know what I mean? And Renee had a say in everything. He had a say in uh, what the choreography looked like. And not that he ever ste overstepped. And if he did, I'd tell him to shut up and sit down because that's the relationship we had. You know, we were like brother and sister. Um, or if I felt like he was overstepping, Jen would be like, okay, Renee, enough. Like, go. I would like, go away. I'm trying to work here. Um, but to the point where, and I've talked about this before, I think, where my process is I listen, 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 listen. Then I'm bored to death. Then I'm listening and thinking about laundry or what I want to eat. And I turn the music off. And I'm like, okay, I got to step back, go do something else. Renee never turns the music off. So there would be times when I worked and worked and worked at home. Janet would invite me over. I'd come over and the song that I've just been working on all morning is playing. And here's Renee going, isn't this the best? Oh my God, this song. I'm like, yeah, it is the best, but can you turn it off? Cause I just listened to that for four hours and on the way up here, cause I'm creating, I'm choreographing for the next song. Or he plays something that I knew wasn't going to be like a fourth or fifth, like single, like way down the line. And he's like in love with it. I'm like, turn it off. I'm not going to want to create it if I'm bored to tears. And so that's what I mean when Renee doesn't have an off button. Like he was so excited and so proud of the music. And it wasn't, I don't think it was because he was involved in it. It was just, he was so always so proud of Janet, no matter what she did, it always kind of surprised him. Like he'd come in and go, Hey you guys, you know, have you heard this or Janet did this? We're like, yeah. Cause we expect that from her. And for him, it just, it was almost like a new day all the time. Like a lot of things that she did that we just kind of all expected would kind of just blow his mind. And either that was just the support and the love and respect that he had for her and what and what she did and what she brought to, to all of us. Something else that kind of um, was, uh, I guess, mentioned uh, in the documentary around your, your section was again, just how much he uh, enjoyed having lots of footage of everything. Uh, like whether you guys were on vacation or behind the scenes. And I, as a fan, that to me has been invaluable because like, for example, on the Janet album, there was that whole like VHS video that they put out like around all the videos. So you could see like what it was like for you guys in rehearsal of that's the way love goes and if, and like as a fan, that was just amazing. And so I will forever be grateful for that, you know, for that footage. Um, do you want to just explain like, yeah, like, because you'd also said, I think it was you in the doc that said like he came from a cameraman background. So that probably is just innately a part of him. Uh, like, was that just who he was or did it really become annoying in the grand scheme of things to always have cameras on? Because in the end, it's invaluable footage for her too. No, I think it's awesome. And I love the fact that that they did that, you know? And I, I, I think it was just kind of a natural thing for Renee to do or to think about. And I'm sure Janet got very comfortable with it. and. You know, she also was aware of the, what, what do I want to call it? Just the value of behind the scenes footage and all of that stuff. So, I mean, and I'm horrible at it. You know, I'll teach a class and walk out, go, oh my God, I didn't even tape anything. Because that's just not where my mind is. I've never been one to pick up a camera because I'm just so in it. 
And I think that's just the difference. That's from Renee's background, from his experience. That's like his first thought is grab a camera and boom, his brother, Yudi, also cameraman and a uh, great photographer. So a lot of those photos were, were from him. Um, and he would do a lot of the behind the scenes stuff too. Um, it wasn't always Renee with the camera, only when I'm flipping them off, it's usually Renee. <laughs> um, it was just, you know, you just got used to it. It was, it's kind of just when somebody has their creative process and you're around it, it's just, that's what it is. It wasn't intrusive. Um, and if it ever felt that way, it, the cameras just went off, you know, it's like, I'm getting dressed, like turn the camera, don't come in, you know, stuff like that. But it, it, it was just kind of part of all of it. And I'm so grateful because, you know, the great thing about the doc is I saw footage that I didn't even know existed. I was like, whoa. Um, yeah, I didn't know the, uh, my butt in a thong existed. I knew that I wore that. Didn't know anyone caught it on camera. Like, thanks. Thanks, guys. I'm glad you answered that because I was going to ask you about that because I'm sure the fans are super happy to see. You look amazing. So dying. I had no idea that that was going to show up again. I didn't even know that was out there living. So, mm -hmm. but I was, but then the other part of me was like, Oh my God, like, I, wow. Okay. Wow. I'm proud of that. But yeah, but sadly I remember thinking that I needed to lose five pounds. I always thought I needed to lose five pounds. Now I feel like I need to lose 35 pounds, which is the truth. I have a scale that does not lie. <laughs> But yeah, that's kind of a weird thing, right? When you look back and go, whoa, what was, what was wrong with me mm. that I thought I needed to lose weight and like, wow. And I'm glad that you, like, as someone who was a part of that is grateful for the value of that, of that footage, because yeah, like, I think so many of us wish a camera was capturing some of our life moments and we just don't because we're, we're not celebrities and we're just trying to get through life. And the fact that, you know, Renee and, and whoever else decided to, to, to make that happen uh, for, I think, I think like altruistic reasons, like for her art and to capture her legacy and it, it is proven to be a value. So, you know, I think that's amazing. And I'm glad, uh, to have been able to see, yeah, some new footage that we hadn't have seen before. And, um, I guess just wrapping up this kind of segment with you, um, again, you being a friend with, with Janet and with Renee, uh, it must've been really challenging for you to see things come to an end for them. Yeah, that before I talked about that, because I was trying to get in, but the Zoom thing wouldn't let me. Um, that was the the, uh, the other thing that um, I think Janet, be, you know, coming from her background in the Jackson family, understanding entertainment, understanding legacy, Renee also saw that. And I think together they both understood uh, the value of of this footage living on in her legacy and whatnot. So, um, and that, like you said, a lot of us aren't celebrities and we don't think we don't have that opportunity. Well, we do have the opportunity, but our mindset isn't about, you know, what's going to be in a vault, what's going to live on and how we want it to be perceived. So to your second question, um, it was it was weird uh, when any time your friends are going through something, right? Um, whether they're celebrities or not, if you love them both equally, and you guys have been a family, we were a family for how long, you know? Um, and like I said, Renee was like a brother to me, and. And kind of like everything we did was like the three of us as far as, you know, deciding like how we wanted the, the show to look, how we wanted the dancers to look, like what was the ratio? We're going to do guys and girls. And it was kind of as always this like free flow discussion between us all. And when things started to go south, like we were on tour, so we're just going and going. And, you know, one of the things that uh, Reby made a really good point on the documentary is that Janet is extremely private. And one thing that people don't understand is like, well, you know, you should know because you were her best friend or, you know, one of her best friends. And we didn't talk about stuff like that. I had a very clear boundary in my mind of 
you know, when to come to Janet for certain things. So if it was just a friendship thing, I would come to her. If it was a business thing, I knew to go to Jaime. I would never bombard her with stuff like that or put her on the spot. Um, and I don't even remember really much of, like, I never saw them fight or argue much, you know, unless it was like a kind of a petty argument that we all have. But I, I just kind of almost didn't see it coming, so to speak. You know, I didn't know they were having those kind of problems. And I just knew that all of a sudden, Renee, who had been by her side this entire time, was not on tour with us for a minute. And I we just kind of all assume like, oh, he must be working on something for Janet and he's going on ahead to get it going. And that's kind of where the thought process was, I think, for most of us. Um, there was a moment when her and I did speak and she was honest with me and let me kind of know at that point that no, it wasn't a project, that they, they were having difficulties. Um, and really, I just didn't ask. And either one of them, you know, I think uh, for the most part, I put my head in the sand. I'm just like, I was going to pretend this isn't happening. They're going to work it out. Everything's going to be fine. This is just stress. This is just what happens and everything's going to be fine. And then it just, it just wasn't. And literally I kind of find out, found out with everybody else because I didn't go in chat rooms hardly. I didn't, I don't ever read all that crap. Uh, you know, in papers. And the reason is, and I'm glad they, when they showed it, it was so funny when they showed on the documentary when Michael was having his issues and that we were at the beginning of the Janet tour. And um, when I stopped believing the press was that day because I'm getting dressed for rehearsal and I see some reporter outside of the Havenhurst house going, talking about Michael and, you know, and Janet's on her way to be with her, with her brother. And I called her, I was like, are you not on the way to rehearsal right now? She's like, yeah, I'm like, okay. They just said you were in Australia. Just want to make sure we're going to rehearsal. And so it kind of gave me a different perspective. Like, oh, they don't always know what they're talking about or telling the truth. Um, so I just really stayed away from the gossip because I wanted to know what was going on from either one of their mouths and they weren't saying it and I wasn't asking and that's just how it was. But it was like a gut punch. It was like when it was over and I heard that they were actually getting divorced, it really, really was heartbreaking for me. I have, I have no doubt at all. And just, you know, on behalf of the fans who I think experienced Janet and Renee during the nineties, um, me being one of them, because he, he did, you know, graciously give me front row tickets, you know, um, I just, I'm so grateful that they were together for that time. Um, and, and that time was clearly meant to happen from the universe. And so I'm just grateful that, that we had that and, and that they were both so supportive of each other during their, their time together. So that's amazing. And I wanted to move on to, there's a couple things that we have to talk about. First of all, um, yeah. I did not know about the Coca-Cola situation. Uh, did you like, didn't. you didn't either. Okay. Cause you were there at that time, right? That was like early nineties. So you would have been there. So you didn't know that was going on. Well, no. And I don't, you know, again, <laughs> you would have thought I did drugs, even though I didn't. Cause I just can't remember things like so specific. And it's usually cause I wasn't present, right? I'm thinking about this, this conversation's going, I'm like, are they talking to me? Cause I wasn't listening, like what's happening. Um, I want to say that there was talk of a Coca-Cola commercial. Cause of course, as a dancer, you're like, woo, I get to be, you know, in a commercial and it's going to be sag and I'll get rich. And you know, we're, that's where kind of our mind goes, but I don't remember it coming and then going away. So it may have been so, premature to tell us, even though Renee was like a little kid. So it's like any time there was like a, an ounce of, hey guys, guess what? Even if it's like so far fetched, he will spill the bean. So I'm surprised that I don't remember that. But um, yeah, I just, I don't, it may not have made it down, you know, down the total hole at that, at that point, but 
what I do know is that, yeah, a lot of stuff was happening. I mean, we postponed the tour for two months. I did not do that. So you postponed yeah. the tour for two months. Yeah, but we didn't stop rehearsing. Like, I think it was so like, we don't know what's happening right now. Uh, we did know, or at least I knew it was because of all the chaos. Like, well, we can't really go out now with all of this going on. Um, but we were still in rehearsal. So our first show for the Janet tour, we were exhausted because we, again, we were like, we were rehearsing and doing production rehearsals for nobody for all of that time. I think just trying to figure out when we were actually going to kind of get the green light to go out again. In the documentary, as Janet talked about um, these, these situations that she went through, you know, being Michael's sister and letting us know that it did affect her. Like, and again, you already telling us that she's a very private person. We already know that she's a very private person, but did you get a sense T like during, you know, the, the Janet tour being put on, on like holding pattern for two months, like, was it weighing on her a lot? Like, did you get that sense or was she able to compartmentalize? I think she was able to compartmentalize again. She, you know, it, it, again, it was all kind of still, um, a new frontier, right? We, she'd only done the one tour, which was rhythm nation at the time. Um, this was like a new thing and she's just on fire. Um, but she never shared that kind of stuff. Like she never, Janet just never about stuff, right? If you, if something was wrong with her, like maybe she'd get a little sad and down, but you'd ask her what was wrong and she'd be like, I'm just tired. Or, you know, she would just really would leave it her, especially if it included her family, it was very private. She left it over there and she never brought anything to any of us about what she was dealing with emotionally. Now I'm sure, you know, she had Renee there, they were going through it together and they were there for each other or he was there for her especially, but um, they really did keep that away from all of us. Do you think in a way, especially like, you know, again, you were a part of so many tours and so many projects with her. Um, you know, you guys were called the kids for so many years and then she, you know, she's continued that. Do you think that the kids and the band and you guys as a unit were her sanctuary in a way? I think so, yeah. It was an escape, um, a creative escape and you know, you know, when that really hit me, you're going to laugh because it's like, really, it took you that long to figure it out. Because when you're in something, right, you just, it's just the way it is. And yes, we were family and we bonded and we all loved each other and we really loved performing. Uh, you know, I have to say that they're looking at that documentary. One of the things that triggered my brain was like, you know, I never got sick of one of her songs and that doesn't happen for me. I get so bored or, or there's just music that I'm, eh, wish this song wasn't in the set and that never happened. Right. So I felt very fortunate in that, in that sense, but as far as being her sanctuary and her family, when we did the Super Bowl, not Super Bowl, when we did the Hollywood Bowl performance and there were all the different generations, right? Uh, from Anthony on down. And I don't even know how many of us were on, on that stage, 25 maybe, and, and she's introducing all of us. That's when it clicked for me because I was kind of, right? We were like the pioneers. We were like the first kids. So to now look back at all the generations and the people that she's, you know, um, that she is just brought into her realm, you kind of look around and go, oh, I, I get it. Like when Janet's not working, she's just at home and it's Janet. And at that time it was Renee and they were working on the next project, right? So it wasn't like, I mean, this was her life, right? This was her family and every tour it was, uh, even bigger family or a different family, but that was her family. Were you surprised that, cause you and I, you know, I've had you on the show to talk about the 20th anniversary of Scream back in, in 2015, we, we, we talked about that. And um, you would let me know that it definitely was a challenging project to get through for many different reasons. And mm -hmm. 
Janet now came forward in her documentary and put forth some of those reasons as to why it was challenging. Uh, were you surprised that she would do that knowing, and again, not that she slagged Michael cause she didn't, but just letting us know that it, as much as she loved him and as much as she, as he loved her, uh, it was challenging putting two super powers together. Have you put it that way? Um, because of, I think the people around them, maybe. Um, I would have been surprised probably if this was years ago, but I think where she is in life and the fact that she wasn't slamming him, you know, and she was just being honest. I just think there was enough time and enough space where people could he hear her words and not immediately, you know, start a buzz. Oh, Janet hates her brother, you know, as people do. I think there's just been enough time away from it. You know, what was news to me was that, according to her, she said it was the label that was doing that. I never knew that. I just thought it was Michael, quite frankly. It was Michael and his team. Because um, I didn't know the label. I didn't have that interaction. I didn't, I didn't even know who the label was, right? And, and it's funny because sometimes you think when people reach a certain um, height in their career, like Michael or Janet, that management can't tell you what to do or labels can't tell you what to do or interfere fear as much. So, I mean, I have to take her for her word because again, she knew things that I didn't, but my entire experience was that it was Michael that wanted the privacy and the separation and wasn't allowing us all to be a part of this project because I didn't feel like he was reaching out at all. Was that frustrating too? Because, um, you know, I know it was you and Sean Cheeseman and obviously Renee very much a big part of that. Was was Renee frustrated by things, knowing that he tries to manage Janet's situation? Renee was losing every day. <laughs> he was not happy. It was not a good environment, you know, and Sean and I, I remember there was a couple of times where it's like, OK, we are going to be positive today. We're going to be fun because the, it's like the best project of life just was going rah, rah, rah. every day we came in, you know, Renee's where's the dance set up? Where is it? Like he was angry every day because they had yet to build the set for our dance to take place. And as we've talked about before, you know, originally they didn't want choreo. The director didn't want choreogra choreography. He wanted more freestyle and just let them have fun. And Renee was very, very adamant that this was going to happen, you know, no matter what it took. And so there was a lot of tension, I think, um, because he felt, you know, slighted by all of it, too. It's like, is anyone listening to us? What's happening? And I don't think that thing got built until the last day or, you know, the day before we actually shot it. It wasn't like. And, you know, that's that was the moment that everyone was waiting for. It's like, why are we fighting to get this to happen? It's very strange. It was actually interesting watching Janet's facial expressions in the documentary when she was talking about it. Uh, just even the part where she was like, it took so long, like it was supposed to be like a short shoot. And then it took seven days. Like you could almost see the the wheels turning in her head, like remembering being in that moment because she actually looked in the doc in that moment, like just still like fatigued by what had happened you know like it was it was interesting to watch it is fatiguing when you have such high expectations and then it just felt like everything was kind of running through the mud it's like you know waist high it's like everything was so challenging on that and had it been anybody else I don't think it would have landed so hard but because it was her brother and her and it was just like it it oh it probably felt like it this should have just been easy so when you have those kind of expectations and then they're not it's even more dramatic right what was interesting too to see was like the footage that they had of her and him in their in the apartment writing the song because it, it did seem like such a positive vibe then and it must have been in those initial stages uh for janet 
uh, and Michael. And then, yeah, to know that later on, it, it did prove to be such a challenge just to get the music video done and, and get that finished. And and can you just let the fans know, because I know at the end, Janet did something very special for you and Sean Cheeseman, right? At the end of Scream. Yeah, at the end of Scream. Oh yeah, she got us the pretty party gifts. <laughs> so yeah, I got it this really beautiful bracelet. Uh, I think Sean got this beautiful, I forget the uh, designer that she would, the, the fans would know, but she always wore these big silver buckle belts at that time. And I remember she bought him something really beautiful like that. And it was, it was really kind of like, guys, thanks for, thanks for, for hanging out. Cause she knew it was, it was stress on all of us, you know, but did it mean extra for you. Did it mean extra for you T when you did win the MTV award for scream? knowing what you had been through to get there? Um, kinda, like it still, it, for me, I just always feel like you wanna win something like that unscarred. So when it happened, there was still just like, well, that's great, but I wish it would have been with like a, a really great positive feeling underneath it all okay and is it fair to say um just about screaming of like of itself because i i feel as a fan you know she brought to the situation just so much street cred to that collaboration because she was on fire at that point like to me like he needed her a million percent in that moment and i feel like she swooped in as a sister would like wanting to help and I feel like she didn't get, and not recognition is not the right word, but like she didn't get a reciprocated response, I feel. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. Okay, okay. Now, uh, as you watch the documentary, were there any parts that stood out to you? Like, I know you said there was some footage you hadn't seen, especially your nice bikini shot. Mm -hmm. um, but like, was there other parts that just stuck out to you where you were like, wow, this is like amazing. Or I didn't know this. Yeah. Like I never saw the footage of her and Michael working on scream. I thought that was really cool. Um, and then, uh, the thing with her and Renee in the hotel room, I'd never seen that either. And I thought that was kind of neat. Um, but I also saw that all the time, right? I would see it at their house. I would see it wherever they were, it was always kind of like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it just, it's interesting. There wasn't a lot that I hadn't seen, but those two things really stuck out to me. And, you know, knowing that I can't even imagine the work that had to go into this to put her entire life and career in four hours, because like, she has so much and knowing that she has all that footage too, I can't even imagine how many hours were spent just like uh, sifting through it. Um, but like, what was it like to see some of the people that were in there, like Reeby, like uh, Jimmy Jam, you know, people who, who have meant something to her obviously forever, especially her sister, obviously. Um, you know, I love me some Jimmy Jam. <laughs> yes, love me Jimmy Jam. And Terry, like those guys are just great. And they've always just you know, like, they have such a positive uh, energy all the time. Oh, that was the other footage I had never seen was her in the studio kind of getting a little upset with Jimmy. Um, because I never saw that side of her. Like we never really had disagreements or never had a reason to raise our voice or be upset about anything. Like. You know, if Janet didn't like something, she would just smile. And I'm like, I know what that means. She's like, what? I'm like, you don't like it. She's like, I didn't say that. I go, but you're not saying that you do. You're just smiling at me. I'm going to rework that. I'll be back. Because she didn't, she, Janet, you know, she just didn't like to make people feel bad ever. Um, but there would come a po point where I'm like, listen, don't make me waste my time thinking that you like this. If you don't, please just tell me so I can stop it now and go fix it. And it just would take everything for her to be like, well, maybe we could try some, like she could just never say, I don't like it or 
she didn't want to hurt your creativity. She didn't want to hurt your feelings. So in that moment with her and Jimmy in the studio, I'm dying laughing, watching the doc going, well, good for you. I've never seen you kind of go, you know what? I don't need this. I'm out of here. Cause I just had never seen that before. So it was kind of refreshing to go, well, okay, good. She was taking care of herself. I like that. Cause I, I believe that was during rhythm nation and you were, were you there? You were there for, for the Janet album, right? I think I was, I was there in Minneapolis. Yeah. For the Janet album and some of the velvet rope album or no, was I there? See, I can't remember anything. I was there for for bits, but I wasn't actually in the, I don't think I was ever in the studio for the Janet tour, but I was in there um, for Velvet Row. Cause I remember listening to her vocal for uh, Anytime, Any Place. Was that Velvet Row? That was uh, Janet album. Okay, then what was the other sexy one on? Uh, I Get Lonely? No, no, there is, no. no. Well, then maybe it was the Janet album. I was there listening. Okay. And that was kind of cool. I'm like, oh, I'm just kind of chilling here, you know, taking a nap on the sofa while she's like laying down vocals. This is pretty awesome. How was she in the studio when you were there? Like, was she, did she slave over vocals, like do things a million times? Or was she like, or, or you know, cause I feel like she's very talented. So she could probably knock it out in the first or second go round. But I know that certain people still want to do it 10 times just to make sure. Yeah, I think that, um, well, first of all, Janet always stacked all of her harmonies. So she was always in there doing a million stacks anyway. And then when you're working with someone like Jimmy, and I'm glad that they showed that, because you know, the funny thing is a lot of producers will do that. Like, okay, just do it again. Just do it again. Because I had the same situation when I was working on music. And I'm like, well, what's wrong? Like, tell me what to do different. I don't want to just keep singing it over and over again, which I think was the point she was trying to make. It's like, am I flat? Am I sharp? Am I not like, what, what do you need? Why am I doing this over and over again? Um, but I think that's a natural process. You know what I mean? I think, um, there are probably very few, maybe like Adele that could just go in and lay it all out in one take and leave. But, um, you know, Janet being a perfectionist, Jimmy being a perfectionist. I just think there was probably a lot of takes for all the songs. Did that uh, translate as well to when you were on the video set, uh, T? Like, you know, how many times, let's say, did you go through if sections, like when you guys were doing that? And and did she, like, obviously I know there's a director, whether it was Renee or, uh, you know, Dominic Senna or whoever else was doing it, but did she often go and, and, and look back at footage and be like, nope, we're doing that again? Uh... She would, but, um, you know, it was really a collaboration with when she trusts somebody, she really does trust you. And, and Dominic Senna was amazing for if, but I think with having Renee there, having Dominic, having myself there, there were times and it would be very sp on specific things, right? Maybe on her close-ups, maybe on her individual shot, she would really take a lot of time, but um, but I do remember there were times where before we moved on, she was going to okay that, yes, we got the shot that she wanted, um, especially for if I remember that because especially, you know, her and Michael were very, um, very much about the locked off head to toe. Don't cut the dance. We want to see it all. Don't destroy it. So there were times that she wanted to make sure more than anything that the dance was being captured the way that it should have been. I wanted to ask you as someone who has worked with so many, you know, A-list stars, Shakira, Ricky Martin, Rihanna, um, Jennifer Lopez, Brittany, like the list goes on and on. And obviously your time with Janet was so many years. Um, can you give your thoughts on what it is about Janet Jackson that makes her so special? Because like, she's this powerhouse, gifted, talented black woman who at the same time feels like everyone's best friend from high school. <laughs> You know what? Um, I would say there's two key components. One is that she is genuinely a kind person. She genuinely wants the best for somebody else, right? She's not insecure and feels that if, hey, if you've got something that somehow that that takes away from her, she doesn't have that in her psyche at all. And I think the other thing that makes her her is that she's not freaking crazy like 
I've worked with a lot of people and they're crazy or they get unbelievably out of control for something that's so minor, right? Okay, so I, like I literally remember when we were doing, it was the velvet rope and like, you know, they, they show you a drawing, they show you a, a 3D thing of what the stage is gonna look like and how everything's gonna be perfect and you get really excited and then, you know, things start getting shipped in during production rehearsal and you pull it out of the box, you're like, that's not what we wanted. That's not what we signed up for, right? And it felt like during production rehearsals for Velvet Rope, like every thing that came in was out of scale. Something was wrong. And it was literally everything to the point where Chris Lamb, who was our um, production manager, goes, uh, can I have you guys come check out something in the stage? And Janet and I walked out there and the ropes that hung at the very top were like five times too long. So they were like almost touching the stage and we just both started laughing. Which, Cause we're like at this point, everything that has come for the stage has been wrong. And again, out of scale and anybody else, not anybody else. There's a few artists that I had that been the situation production would have shut down, someone would have got cussed out, someone would have been in the dressing room screaming and crying and kicking when that just not who Janet is. She's kind of like, so how do we fix it? Like she doesn't waste time kicking and screaming and crying. She's like, how do we fix it? How do we move forward? And let's just be done with it. Let's move on. So to me, that's, I think, why she is such a wonderful person to work with and be friends with. Amazing. And, you know, as we were watching the tail end of the doc, uh, you know, you get the sense that obviously she's at peace with herself as she should be at, you know, this stage of the game because she's she's done so many wonderful things in her life, in her career. Um, the part that scared me was at the end when she seemed to intone that she might be retiring at some point. Uh, like she didn't say it, but there was like, like an intonation and I had like my heart was like no you can never <laughs> like and I'm just wondering as someone who again was so close to her for so long and is remains one of her friends um like I feel like she's competitive and will always want to be out there for the fans on, on some level or do you think she she may just just call it a day at some point and and just be like not I, like microphone drop <laughs> you said that like you were about to cry <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the world, the world always needs Janet Jackson. I feel like we will always need her and her positivity and her music. So. Right. You know what? I don't know. I, I, cause uh, you and I spoke about that briefly. I didn't get that from watching, but again, you know, some things go over my head. Like, Oh, is that what she meant? Oh, is that what she said? I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> so I don't know, but you know, I think. Yeah, I can't imagine Janet stopping. I just can't. She hasn't this far. And and I know how much she loves what she does, but I can speak to myself being at the age I am now, and I can't imagine doing what she does. I, I get out of bed, I'm like, ouch. Like, I couldn't even imagine doing all that choreography all the time. Um, but when that's your life and that's your love, you know, you do it, you, but you know, she's got a baby and he's gorgeous. And I think things shift in people's lives when they have children and they want to spend more time. And, you know, it's not like Janet's going to drop off the face of the earth. She has other talents, right? And Funny. she will always do something, I think. Um, so I don't know what that little message meant. I have no idea, okay. but I wish her the best. And for someone again, who was with her for so long and, and knowing her devotion to the fans, can you just kind of comment on what the fans mean to her? Because it just feels like, like very high up on the, on the totem pole in her life. Oh yeah. I think if fans aren't number one, they're number two. I mean, I'm not, and I'm not saying, you know, Oh, that before her family is up before. No, I just meant in general, like, she has always done things with the fans in mind like oh i think the fans will like this i think they will enjoy this oh this would be a great gift 
to give them or include them. Hey, let's do, she's always kind of doing like these one-off things that are specialties just for the fans, right? Um, whether it's like tidbits of information or, you know, tickets for front row um, or, you know, other events that she has. But I think that the fans for Janet are like top of the list all the time. And I think any fan would say that, like they feel it. And she, I, she never takes them for granted. Yeah, amazing. That's exactly, as a fan, that's how I feel. Like, I feel like she legitimately cares about what she's doing and what she gives to the fans and, and enjoys getting the love back, which is, which is amazing because that's a good give and take relationship. And wow. uh, I did want to ask you too, after watching this entire documentary, did it stir up feelings in you? Do you wish at, at some point that you and her, who we often refer to as the A-team, uh, will collaborate again? You know, it's funny, like after uh, so many years, any time that like you and I speak or when we did the Hollywood Bowl or when I get on the phone with Seanette or I'm talking to Nikki, I can't tell you how like, overwhelming it becomes right because we immediately just like just go right back to kind of our time together and i think you don't realize things sometimes until you're really far away from them from them or you get much older and your life changes and you start looking back going oh my god like we knew at the time, which is my only saving grace, right? Because you don't want to look back and go, oh, I wish I would have known. But I, we did know. We did know what um, an enormous opportunity that we had to be able to get paid for doing what we freaking loved to do, right? I mean, how often does that happen? And and at a level that was beyond any of our imaginations, right? And and that became our life for so long. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think after the Hollywood Bowl, I think I had withdrawals for like two weeks. When we got off the call, me, you, when we did Nikki and Kelly and seeing Jimmy, again, probably another week, I'm like texting those guys going, I'm having withdrawals, what's happening? Like, like, can we all get together? Can we just get in a studio? Can we, you know, do something? I don't know, but it's like, so it's this really weird dichotomy of going, could we collaborate again? Would it be any different? Would it be the same, but different or better, or could it be better? Can it be better? I don't know. Like it was the best time, you know, and, and probably some of my best work, I think was because I'm somebody who doesn't work well under drama and stress. And I never had that with her and the normal stress, right. Of, of just wanting to, to create something that, that she would love and feel comfortable doing. Um, and then there's, you know, the the dichotomy of it is like waking up going, God, my knees hurt. I can't even bend down to get my sock. Like, what did I do all those years doing knee drops and, you know, knee spins and whatnot? So it is really hard to go, I don't know. I don't, as much as I would love to, the part of me is that in my brain, collaborating means I, I need to get on stage and do it. And I just know my body just can't anymore. And that, and that's sad and it's frustrating for me for sure. But yeah, it does, it, it's a great memory to have and it's a great feeling to have, but it is sad when you have to realize like, yeah, that's, that's now over in this box and that box may not ever come open again. Mm -hmm. But I hope that the box opens in a different way with the two of you in it. That's my hope. <laughs> um, one more question, which is uh, with regards to letting the fans know what's going on with you, because right now you were sitting in uh, your store, which is a music store, and, yes. and there's all these guitars behind you and amps and all that sort of good stuff, you and your husband, Michael, can you just give a, a brief rundown of the store? And I think people can actually, no matter what part of the country they're in, can probably maybe even order from you guys online. Like, is that an option? Yes, now it is. Thanks to COVID, we were able to get our reverb online sales thing created. Um, yeah, so we opened Loud Music Company two weeks before COVID shut us down, like the rest of the world. 
Like we were literally going, okay, what do we do with these rooms that we built? And when I say we built, we built by hand. So like I painted these walls, my husband put this wood up every single screw there. I don't even know how many thousands of screws are in this place. Um, but we sell vintage and used equipment. Don't let that fool you because some of this old stuff is so dang expensive. I'm like, there's from 1963, one's from like 1959, whatever. It's like, you know, I, I'm still learning all this stuff. Uh, so we sell equipment. We have lessons for kids and they, our kids are phenomenal. They are just so much fun watching them. They're watching them light up. We have a little four year old named Ethan. I hope I can say that playing the drums and the saxophone. He's just unbelievable. I'm like, how do you even hold that thing? <laughs> and every once in a while I end up teaching drum lessons because I'm, I'm learning how to play drums now, which I really love because it just, yeah. I, can I say something really quick about that? Yes, yes. So my husband wanted me to learn drums and I'm like, ah, whatever, I can't, I just can't do all things at one time. And I couldn't get it and I couldn't get it. I was frustrated and he put on, um, which song did he put on first? He put on Rhythm Nation and I'm all of a sudden I was like, I know I, I've danced to this. I know where every cymbal hit is. I know where every drum beat is. And that's how I started learning. He, then he put on, he, he would only play songs that I choreographed to and I could freaking play the drums. I'm like, how did this happen? Like my body just knew what to do because all this music has just stayed inside of me. So long story short, loud music company, vintage equipment, lessons, and we have rehearsal space and we've got like six or seven local bands that come and rehearse here. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's very cool. amazing. And the website, is it loudmusiccompany.com? Is that it? It is loud. Yeah, the website, the, um, yes, loudmusiccompany.com. And we are also on Instagram. Um, I follow. <laughs> silly stuff up there so we just we just did a friday night funny last night so you guys will have to check it out amazing um i love you so much you know this but i'm telling you again and on behalf of the fans like thank you so much for for speaking and, and to be able to elaborate um more about the documentary because I, I know they were pressed for time so your segment couldn't be as long as i'm sure all of us wanted it to be right so thank you so much for, for doing this and uh, yeah, just thank you for the magic with you and Janet and the rest of the team, because our lives would not be the same if it wasn't for you. So like, we love you. Love you too. That is the amazing award-winning choreographer, Tina Landon. Don't forget to follow her on Instagram at I am Tina Landon. Hey, it's Kelly. Thank you so much for hanging out and watching and listening to our interviews. We always appreciate your time. Please make sure to follow us on our YouTube channel and also hit up our website so that you can subscribe to our newsletter so you are always up to date with everything that we have got going on with the show. kellyalexandershow.com slash subscribe.